Well, Governor, first of all, thank you so much for sitting down with us. You're always generous with your time and we appreciate your uh, availability. Thank you so much. Great to be with you again uh, as we uh, get toward the uh, closing days of this legislative session. Well, you say closing days. We're all praying that it's the closing <laughs> days of the legislative session. Um, has this been a good legislative session for you in terms of your legislative agenda? It really has. Uh, first, uh, you know, everybody wondered about the relationship with the leadership and between the executive and legislative branch. And overall, it's been very, very good. And I applaud uh, uh, Senator Hickey and, and Speaker Shepard that they've been good partners through this. It's been a great line of communication. But in terms of my priorities, uh, I'm very, very happy with what we've been able to accomplish in terms of, of raising teacher pay, uh, our computer science initiative, our law enforcement efforts, uh, but then also uh, in, a, in terms of our budgets and tax cuts, we're working together very well and it's gonna be a very successful session on these points. And then you cap that off with uh, passing what some people call a hate crimes bill, but uh, that was a very, it was one of my priorities. It was important for us to do that as a state, and uh, I appreciate the leadership and the way they worked uh, through that and got that passed. So I'm very pleased with those substantive issues coming out of this uh, session. Let's spend just a second on the hate crimes legislation there. It obviously wasn't the version that you thought would come uh, to your desk, but, um, but it does address some of the issues that you want uh, in that respect. Tell me more, I'm, there's gonna be critics of it no matter what, I even if you'd gotten the version that you wanted passed. Tell me how you're going to market that. How, what are you gonna do with that as a law now in terms of advancing Arkansas as a state that has a so-called hate crimes law? Well, I think it speaks for itself, but you know, what's critical is that, what, 47 states have some version of a hate crime law. Many of those states do not protect uh, those uh, based upon uh, gender identification. They do not uh, always uh, have all the protections that we have in our Arkansas bills. So uh, one, it's unique. Uh, secondly, it covers uh, uh, any group, any identifiable group of people and provides that protection that is very broad. So I think it will naturally get some coverage because of its uniqueness and the breadth of its protections. And then where it's really gonna uh, be tested is uh, whenever we do have a crime that would qualify as uh, justifying these enhanced penalties, uh, the 80% uh, parole uh, eligibility requirement where they have to serve more time in prison. And then it's, we're gonna see how it's applied in real life through a prosecutor making a decision. And, uh, and that'll be the test. And we will uh, uh, hope that never has to happen in Arkansas. But the fact that it is there, hopefully, uh, will speak well of our state in terms of, of our tolerance and uh, appreciation for diversity. I don't have to tell you, although you've rattled off some of the things that you are proud to have accomplished this session, teacher pay, computer science credit, the money into long-term reserves, there will be some tax cuts before this legislature uh, adjourns or recesses or whatever they plan on doing. Um, you're gonna have a tough time spending all that because of some of the high profile stuff out there that's been negative, some of the cultural war, some of the social war um, stuff that's out there, is, is that gonna make it difficult for you to advance Arkansas's reputation as a result of what we're seeing with transgender restrictions and some of the gun and abortion bills and some of the other stuff that's been out there that has garnered such negative headlines? Well, I think it's probably a little too early to tell, uh, but that's important for everyone to understand the substantive progress that's been made through this session and not let that be overshadowed by some of the controversial bills. Uh, one of them that I vetoed that it was overridden, but there's other bills that are sub substantively controversial that we're still dealing with in the session. And I, I think what that shows is that, uh, one, uh, this is not unique to Arkansas, that there's many southern states, there's many rural states that uh, engage in these same types of uh, legislation. Uh, girls in sports, for example, which I signed into law, protects the integrity of women's sports. Well, that's something that is being considered in many different states. Other states have adopted that. And so I think in the end, uh, it created controversy, but uh, I don't see any punitive action uh, toward Arkansas as a result of that. 
I am disappointed in the NCAA uh, and the uh, decision that they made about uh, not having championship games uh, in states that they disagree with in policy. And I think that goes too far from their standpoint, but hopefully that will be an outlier. And again, uh, uh, one of the things that we learned also is that uh, the governor has a veto power, but it's easily overridden. And uh, I'll be uh, finished another two years, but if you look down the road for the, for the governors, uh, they need to have a more meaningful veto power in this state. I think the people of Arkansas would support that, but a simple majority to override a veto uh, really weakens uh, the effectiveness of that veto. I want to come back to legislative executive branch uh, jockeying right there, but let's stay where we're at for the second now. As it, it has surprised a lot of people as much cultural and social warfare has been out there with the legislature in this session. Did it surprise you that it was as active as it has been? And um, I mean, what could you have done to have maybe curtailed some of that activism? Oh, I don't think there's anything I could have done. Uh, the legislature was uh, speaking uh, their heart and uh, what they believed was important. And uh, I think the fact that this is a very long session uh, generated uh, more bills, and some of those are controversial bills. So I think uh, that is a factor in it. Uh, but, uh, you know, these bills are passing with uh, supermajority votes. Uh, and I've got three bills coming to my desk that I'll be looking at, uh, which are, uh, you know, protecting Second Amendment, but it does it in a way that uh, restricts uh, state law enforcement cooperating with federal law enforcement. Well, as a former head of the DEA, as someone who has been a United States attorney and understand the importance of federal state cooperation, uh, that gives me heartburn, heartburn. And so I'm going to have to look at those bills very carefully. Uh, but this is a, a conservative state. People are legislators and the public is, is frustrated with what they see coming out of Washington. They just want to push back and so the legislature's trying to push back. Uh, I don't know that there's anything that could be done to stop that other than you know, dialogue, uh, uh, I have, to, uh, you know, these bills come through quickly, and so sometimes uh, whenever it sits on my desk a while, it's a reminder we need to study these bills uh, very carefully and that they can go too far. You mentioned the, the Second Amendment bills that are on your desk there in this state versus federal um, conflict and friction that's out there. I mean, there seems to me that we're, we are passing some bills that are gonna be in direct conflict with constitutional authority here. Um, are you okay with the legislature passing laws that you know are unconstitutional, that you know are gonna get challenged in court? They're gonna cost taxpayers money if they're gonna, if you look at court precedent. I mean, it's not that hard to predict that some of the stuff that will become law with your signature or without, it's gonna cost taxpayers money to defend this. Well, I think it has to be done very thoughtfully. I mean, sometimes you wanna push the envelope just like we did in a challenge to Roe versus Wade. Uh, it's a pro-life piece of legislation, but uh, sometimes those are, are apparently unconstitutional and sometimes found unconstitutional, but it's pushing the envelope to protect life and to shape the direction of the courts. Uh, so you've got that aspect of it, but then you also have, again, these uh, state sovereignty type bills uh, that really puts uh, uh, the supremacy clause uh, on, on its head, and the supremacy clause being that whenever there's a conflict between state law and federal law, that federal law trumps. Well, this says just the opposite, that state law trumps, and, and this is a concern to me because uh, I believe it is unconstitutional. So you've got to balance those. I, I just think it's important that whenever we're looking at this legislation, I take it very seriously. I study it when it gets to my desk. I have a great dialogue with the sponsors on it. Sometimes I sign it, sometimes I'll let it come into law without my signature, and, uh, very, and every once in a while I might veto it. So just to be clear, you are considering a veto on these Second Amendment bills that are coming to your desk? Well, each one would have to stand on its own, and there's one that basically recognizes the difference between interstate commerce and the uh, production of a firearm or an accessory versus intrastate. Well, that's been a historic difference. So that uh, can make some sense to me, but whenever uh, the law is just an affront uh, 
I, I struggle with uh, the refusal for local law enforcement to cooperate with federal law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And for example, I prosecuted the white supremacists, as you know, in the 80s, uh, the CSA, one of the most successful uh, law enforcement operations in our state. And that was a combination of state resources and federal resources going after a neo-Nazi violent group. Well, guess what? They were going after them because they had machine guns that were uh, in the compound, and we were cooperating together. Th under this bill, that would be prohibited. And uh, I, I, I'm going to look very carefully at that. I'm quite frankly surprised you're sitting here with me today after that whole ordeal of you walking into that compound by yourself and negotiating that settlement that you did on that. So for people who don't know that history, it really is worth exploring some more. Um, so let's talk about some legislative executive branch um, friction, as I mentioned earlier here. Uh, the legislature is probably going to propose that they can call themselves into legislative session, a special session if they want to. At least they're going to propose that potential amendment. They've restricted your emergency powers. I know you've worked with them on that. Um, we've talked about a couple of pieces of legislation that restrict their following presidential executive orders and this cooperation with the federal government. There's was even an effort made to take some of your appointment powers away and uh, share that with the legislature. Is the legislature going too far in trying to take authority away from the executive branch of government? Well, first of all, let me emphasize uh, that I think we've had a very good relationship. We have a good dialogue. And so, uh, you know, while I disagree uh, with some of the uh, you know, efforts to diminish the executive branch, to lift up the legislative branch. Uh, while we have those disagreements, overall we've worked together in a good partnership. Now, uh, I hope that it does not go to the uh, ballot for a vote on a referred constitutional amendment that would allow the legislature to call themselves into session. Uh, historically, we've had a part-time legislature uh, that uh, is meets once every two years in regular session, well, uh, this would convert it into really a full-time legislature. And that is, uh, you know, their perception is that the executive branch is very powerful and the legislative branch uh, is, uh, is, is not strong enough and they want to strengthen that. Well, uh, I think you've got to step back a little bit and understand that under our Constitution, the governor has a lot of respect, but structurally, uh, the legislature has a lot of power, particularly with the purse strings. So there's disagreements, but I tell them that there's always natural friction between the executive and the legislative branch, and that's partly designed by our founding fathers. That's mm -hmm. the separation of powers, and so we should not be frustrated by that friction. We need to respect each other and work through in a cooperative way on many of these issues. But no, I, I disagree uh, with uh, the legislature being able to call themselves into session. I think that's it. And hopefully that will not be one of the amendments that come out. Uh, you know, in terms of the emergency powers, uh, we work closely with them. And I, what came out, uh, I think, is a, a fair balance. And you saw that work most recently where I continue the emergency and they affirmed it. Uh, so, uh, and it's good to have legislative support on key uh, initiatives or emergencies. I like legislative support because it strengthens it, strengthens our hand. You basically, you kept the emergency powers intact because a vote failed to, to stop the emergency powers, though. So, Well, which was key. Right. Uh, they don't have to affirm it. They just, uh, if they want to stop it, they can, but they didn't uh, because the burden was on them. I think that's fine because it's limited to a pandemic. We're not talking about earthquakes. We're not talking about uh, natural disasters in that traditional sense. Uh, this is pandemics which are long lasting and if it's going to continue that long we want to make sure that the legislature has support for it. The session's not over yet so I will let you reserve the right to address this answer again once the session does end. What's disappointed you the most about this legislative session? Either something you haven't gotten done or something you've had to deal with that you wish you didn't. Well, I, th I think the uh, uh, probably the disappointment it would would simply be in that uh, uh, we were not able to uh, stay away from uh, uh, so many controversial uh, bills that uh, I think were 
uh, probably unnecessary. Uh, but I, I don't want to dwell on the negative here. Uh, I think it has been a good session. If I look at going back, you know, what could we have done better? Uh, I think let's let the dust settle before we actually determine that. Obviously, uh, you know, the uh, the veto that was overridden is is uh, uh, one that uh, I disagree with substantively. But yeah. you have to also remember, I vetoed another bill and they sustained it. Uh, and You're so not the first governor that's had a veto overridden. I so. won't be the last yeah, either. No, <laughs> uh, last question on the legislature uh, in terms of the session. Are, are you going to be able to get the R home, the Medicaid expansion funded and through? Uh, that's another great success story is that uh, we've been able to get the reauthorization for our Medicaid expansion, our homes. We converted it to make it uh, uh, fit more perfectly here in an Arkansas environment, a rural state. Uh, and uh, we just simply have to get through the broad appropriation bill for uh, Medicaid itself. Uh, that's one of the functions of the legislature and function of government is to fund it. So I fully expect that to happen. But, you know, when you have a three-fourths vote, uh, sometimes they wait toward the end to do that. So I, uh, I'm counting on that happening. Let's turn our attention to two of your potential successors as governor released their fundraising reports this week. We see Sarah Huckabee Sanders uh, on the GOP side raised $4.8 million, a staggering amount of money that she's raised there. Leslie Rutledge uh, raised, I think, around 200000 for the quarter, but she's raised over a million. Um, I'm assuming that you're going to back the Republican nominee, whoever that may be, at the appropriate time. What do you think the two of them offer right now in terms of a vision for the state? Well, both of them, I thought, uh, uh, was pretty impressive in terms of the fundraising. Obviously, uh, the uh, uh, lead with Sarah Huckabee Sanders uh, was, uh, you know, a record that was set. Uh, you got to say hats off to that. Uh, uh, but. You know, in terms of uh, how the race is conducted, I hope that it shows uh, the strength of the Republican Party. I hope it has a good debate, a discussion of, of ideas that are important for the, the future of this state. So I'm, a, I'm an observer. Uh, I stand back and just like any other citizen, I'm going to watch it with great interest. I love watching politics and studying it. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to observe it just like you do, Roby. Uh, you got a shot taken at you from the former president this last week. I know you're aware of that. You've been asked about this. He called you a lightweight rhino, Republican in name uh, only, which I find kind of amusing since you've been around the Republican Party for about 50 years and he's been around it for about five. Um, what do you make of him taking pot shots at you on that? I mean, that's kind of a violation of the Reagan rule, isn't it? Say no, <laughs> say nothing bad about a fellow Republican. Well, I, I don't know that he ever followed the Reagan rule or uh, and. and you know, uh, President Trump, uh, I'm not necessarily surprised. I indicated that I wouldn't support him in 2024. I don't necessarily expect him to run, but uh, I, I thought he uh, uh, did not handle and did not lead our country in the right direction post-election uh, on January 6th. And, uh, uh, you know, that's part of speaking your mind, and that's part of him speaking his mind. I, I don't take, I don't get bent out of shape about that. I've expected it. and. Uh, Sometimes he has a little bit of fun with it. I look at my fellow governors, and he's poked at them, uh, you know, from Doug Ducey in Arizona to Brian Kemp in Georgia, and so I'm not in too bad a company there. <laughs> uh, is Donald Trump still the de facto head of the Republican Party when you look at uh, nationally who leads the Republican Party right now? I, I wouldn't consider him that uh, at all. Uh, you know, you can make a case that there's many voices, and it's traditional whenever uh, we don't have the White House, you have many different voices of leadership uh, in the party. And uh, uh, governors are one. You've got uh, Senate and House leadership on the Republican side. But President Trump has, a, has the largest megaphone now just because he has such an enormous following of, of support and voters. So uh, he's certainly a player. I pay attention to that. Uh, but uh, there's many voices in the party, and I hope we have uh, a good discussion of ideas and the future uh, uh, going into 2022. John Brummett has done his dead level best to try to bait you into saying that you're thinking about running for president of the United States at some point in time. I know you read him on that. Uh, everyone always asks me, what is Asa going to do after uh, he's governor? I know your term's not over yet, so I'm not trying to rush you out the door, but why don't you break a little news this morning 
and go ahead and tell me what you plan on doing after uh, <laughs> you're not governor. Well, uh, let me phrase it a little bit different way that uh, I've got, uh, you know, you look at this when the session is over with, uh, I'll be moving into the leadership, already in the leadership of the National Governor Association. I'll be chair of that uh, for really uh, the last year of, of my uh, governorship, and that's a great opportunity to uh, help forge partnerships and move our country in the right direction from a state standpoint. Uh, so I'm excited about that. And then uh, 2022 is a very, very important year for our country and for our party. And I want to be engaged in that debate. And so when the legislative session is over with, uh, I hope to set up a, a leader, national leadership uh, effort called uh, America Strong and Free, and uh, where uh, I can uh, help influence uh, the direction of our country in 2022. We'll see where that leads. Uh, and as you know, uh, when you finish your time as governor, I, I could go back just like I have many times and been in the private sector and love life. But I am concerned about uh, what the future holds uh, under the uh, Biden administration. We're spending too much money. We're over-regulating. There's a lot of pushback. And, and I think it's important for me to be the a balanced voice, but also uh, an important voice in uh, pushing back on that, but also shaping uh, our party in a good way in 2022. So you're saying there's a chance. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm saying uh, we're going to see how this all plays out, and I'm going to finish strong. We've got a pandemic still to end. So this, uh, is this a pack that you're starting? Uh, this It'll be a, uh, two parts of America Strong and Free. One will be an educational uh, branch of that that will help uh, raise money, educate people on uh, principles and issues, and then there will be a leadership pack part of it that will help uh, in supporting uh, candidates, but also uh, the national voice uh, uh, in terms of uh, my what I can do in 2022. All right, last question for you. We made it through the entire interview. You're the one that brought up pandemic here. I was going to save a pandemic question for the end. We're roughly at 20% uh, in our total vaccinations, full, uh, complete vaccinations in Arkansas. That's still quite a ways away from 70% for herd immunity. Are yeah. we going to get there? It's going to be hard. Uh, we've got to have everybody uh, lining up saying we're going to get the vaccine. I, I make the point that at first we didn't have enough supply. There was a shortage of supply. You know, we had to go through the priorities. Now there's supply. Supply is not an issue, even with J&J &J, uh, being paused for a moment. Supply is there. So if we're not getting people vaccinated, it's on you. It's on the public. And so we're going to work hard to get in every nook and cranny of Arkansas, but we need people to line up, get it done, don't put it off. And uh, we're going to get to 50 percent. It's going to be really hard to get on up to 70 percent. But whenever you look at what's happening in other states with cases going up, that's our future unless we get that vaccine out there. And so uh, you talk about my future, that's my future is preaching that word for uh, uh, some time. Governor Asa Hutchinson, as always, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Roby.